Here along the Channel Coast of England begins one of the most remarkable stories of the war. It's the story of the creation of the artificial harbors in Normandy. The strange contraptions which you see here made possible our entire operation in France. They enabled us to land six armies across open storm-swept beaches and to supply our armies when the Germans wrecked the French ports. These huge hollow blocks of reinforced concrete are called phoenixes. Each phoenix is 200 feet long, 60 feet high, 40 feet thick, and weighs 8,000 tons. More than 100 phoenixes were built in England to be towed across the channel to form breakwaters. This device is a Lobnitz pier These 480-foot bridge sections are called whales. When the whales are assembled, they form a continuous bridge like this practice assembly put together by the sea bees at the Isle of Wight. The Lobnitz piers rise and fall with the tide at the offshore end of the bridge. Captain Clark was in charge of the landing operation at Omaha Beach, and Commander Collier of the 108th CB Battalion was in charge of towing and sinking the Phoenixes. This was the greatest towing operation in history. Many of the invasion ships towed sections of the harbor installations. The tows were made ready on D-2. More than 300 tugs were used. One tug was assigned to a phoenix or a whale or a Lobnitz pier. The bridge sections or whales floated on special pontoons called beetles. Some of the beetles were made of steel, others of concrete. Each whale had a towing crew of six sea bees. Here a tug is preparing to tow a phoenix. The long whales crawl like serpents across the channel. The steel posts sticking in the air from the corners of the Lobnitz Pier are called spuds. A dumb barge. Many of these, loaded with ammunition and rations, were towed over and rammed high and dry onto the beach. Our planes blanketed the towing lanes. Each Phoenix carried a six-man CB towing crew and a 12-man Army gun crew. The gun is a 40-millimeter AA. Glider troops passed over the convoy at H minus two hours. A Corvette, part of the escorting force.
To create the artificial harbor, we began by sinking the phoenixes along a rough semicircle swinging outward from Omaha Beach. Beyond the phoenixes, the bombardons were moored to reduce wave action at the entrances to the harbor. Inside the harbor, the 3,000-foot bridges were assembled, running out to the floating Lobnitz piers. The 2,100-foot sunken causeways afforded dry, firm surfaces for landing at any tidal stage. The seawall was completed by the line of sunken ships. The lateral tide range was 2,000 feet. This meant that at low tide, 2,000 feet of the bridges were resting on sand and 2,000 feet of the causeways were exposed. Note the water depths. The vertical tidal range was 18 and a half feet. The phoenixes were sunk in water that was 32 and a half feet deep at low tide and 51 feet deep at high tide. The first tows began arriving at Omaha on the afternoon of D-Day. As the phoenixes arrived, they were carefully jockeyed into position. Each phoenix was simply a floating section of a seawall. And the problem was to sink the phoenixes so as to form an effective barrier against the fierce channel waves. Each phoenix has 10 compartments, which were flooded to sink the phoenix into position. At high tide, the sunken phoenixes had nine feet of freeboard. Thirty-nine phoenixes were sunk at Omaha, and the seawall was completed on D plus seven. The onshore end of the first bridge section was secured at high tide on D plus three. Then at each subsequent high tide, additional sections were added. When the first bridge was completed to a full length of 3,000 feet, the Lobnitz piers were moved into position. The towering corner legs, or spuds, were dropped to the ocean bottom, and the piers rose and fell with the tide on these spuds.
The first bridge was completed on D plus 11. Admiral Kirk inspected the assembly. The first LST docked on D plus 11. The piers were designed to handle both LSTs and coastal freighters, but there was not enough water around them for Liberty ships. On June 17th, the harbor was completed at Omaha, three days ahead of schedule. In addition to sinking the Phoenixes, we sank 13 block ships at Omaha. They were sunk in line, just as the Phoenixes were sunk. They helped reduce wave action and provided moorings for landing craft. The old British battleship Centurion was one of the ships sunk. She fought at Jutland. Most of the sunken ships, however, were liberties. They were brought into line, then their bottoms were blasted. The British crew stood at attention while the old Centurion went down. On shore at Omaha, the CBs established and operated the Navy camp. Reinforced foxholes were standard quarters, and mines were a persistent problem. Commander Jardine of the 111th Battalion commanded Rhino ferries and CB shore activities at Omaha. Then the storm struck. It came on June 18th, almost without warning. Not in 20 years had such a storm hit the channel in June. The bridges and piers were a twisted mass of wreckage. The waves had washed over the phoenixes, breaking their eight-inch walls. The sunken ships were badly battered. Some of them had their backs broken. Two hundred and fifty-two craft were piled onto the beach and wrecked.
For three days, the fierce onshore winds had beaten at our installations, and we were unable to land a single pound of supplies. Had the storm struck a few days earlier, it might have defeated the entire operation. The story of the Spanish Armada might have been repeated. The bridge served as a dam to pile up the water. It was a catch-all for small craft. LCTs piled on top of one another. The concrete beetles were demolished. Fortunately, the gun crews on the Phoenixes were taken off before the storm hit. The entire Phoenix Bridge and Pier Assembly at Omaha was abandoned. Additional ships were sunk, however, and the beach continued to function in a limited way. The CB repair barges proved a godsend after the storm. They too had been towed across the channel. A second artificial harbor had been created by the British at Aromash. By luck and circumstance, it survived the storm. These views were made after the storm when the harbor was running at full blast. The general design is the same as at Omaha. These are the Lobnitz Piers at Aramash, almost a mile offshore from the high tide mark. The ships are British coasters. Reinforced by what could be salvaged from Omaha, this harbor has handled a vast tonnage of cargo. This is a rhino ferry taking cargo from a Liberty ship. 32 rhinos were used in Normandy. All of them were built and operated by the Seabees. After we began grounding LSTs on the two American beaches, the rhinos were used exclusively as lighters for the Liberty ships. Each rhino carried an average of 80 vehicles per trip from ship to shore. 
The two outboard engines on the Rhino propel the big barges at a speed of about three knots. Waders and bulldozers met the rhinos at the beach. The problem with the rhinos was to prevent their drying out at the beach. If a rhino dried out, it was out of operation for at least six hours. the rhino control post on the beach. Bulldozers were used to help the rhinos retract. The Navy's famous 1006 pontoon detachment handled the causeways on both Omaha and Utah beaches. The flat beaches required an entirely new causeway technique. Instead of allowing the causeways to float, as we did at Sicily, Salerno, and Anzio, we sank the causeways to their entire length of 2,100 feet. Here the CBs of 1006 are bringing the causeway sections in at high tide and sinking them. All forms of landing craft, up to LCTs, use the causeways. Vehicles which had not been waterproofed could be delivered dry to the beach over the causeways. At Utah Beach, the 81st CB Battalion operated Rhino ferries and established the Navy camp. Commander Jack Greenewalt of Chicago, shown here in his captured German car, was in charge. Commander Hollis, executive officer of the 81st, is at the left, and Dr. Anderson, battalion physician. The camp at Utah was more reinforced foxholes. And even here, good old Navy chow was to be had. They call it spam. At Cherbourg, the 28th CB Battalion handled naval construction and repair. This is the main pier with the wrecked railroad station. The French Line dock. Here the Normandy docked in peacetime and her passengers in train for Paris. a German chart of the harbor at Cherbourg. Possible points of attack were zeroed for the coastal guns.
This German hospital in Cherbourg was reconditioned by the 28th Battalion. Many of our wounded paratroopers were found in this hospital. La Place Napoleon and Naval Headquarters. Dr. Anderson of the 81st Battalion was the first American doctor to deliver a French baby. To express their gratitude, the French family named the baby CB. Here, Dr. Anderson visits the family to check up on little CB. The official birth certificate records the baby's name, Sebe Paula Fouchard. The CBs are not content with delivering the goods. They also deliver the babies. 